Bem-vindos a todos e todas. Uh, welcome all. Um, this conversation that we're having today is part of the Data in Us conversation series that uh, Yad and Isenova are organizing, where we try to kind of un highlight and kind of untangle what data is, what data are, and what they do in the world. Um, and we've already covered stuff like, you know, the datafication of childhood, uh, global surveillance, domestic surveillance. Uh, we're going to continue talking about Facebook moderation or, you know, social media moderation. We'll talk about artificial intelligence. So we have a great number of people who will be joining us throughout the year until December, 2022. And hopefully you guys can join us. Today, we have Natasha Daushu, and I'll introduce her shortly um, in a bit. And the next talk we're having is Tarleton Gillespie. Tarleton is a researcher at Microsoft and he's going to be talking to us about how Facebook does the moderation of the content uh, on its platforms. Um, and he's going to introduce this argument, which seems not to be very commonsensical, which is that uh, the reduction of visibility in the platforms run by uh, Facebook is actually something that is not beneficial. Okay, so we tend to assume that Facebook tends to work against us. He's going to say that the ways in which Facebook works are actually, sorry, beneficial to us. So it's going to be, I think, a re really interesting. And Tarleton has a lot of experience talking about algorithms, etc. So I hope to see you. It's on May 10th, same time, same place. So let's talk about Natasha. Let's see, I think it's time. Yeah, let's do this. Okay, so it is my very great honor to introduce Natasha Daushu. I cannot tell you how excited we are to have her with us today. Natasha is a cultural anthropologist and associate professor in the Department of Media, Culture and Communication at NYU. She has had a distinguished career that spans across numerous very prestigious universities. She received her PhD from Berkeley. She held a postdoctoral uh, position at Columbia and she was an assistant professor at MIT's program in science, technology and society where she was awarded tenure, which is rare and a cause for great congratulations. In 2012, Natasha published what I consider to be one of the best contemporary ethnographies ever written. Her book titled Addiction by Design is based on 15 years of ethnographic research on the gambling industry. In this book, she shows how the experience of addicted gamblers is intimately connected to and fueled by the design of slot machines, casinos, algorithms, ergonomics, marketing campaigns, and the very city of Las Vegas. What is most striking about this ethnography is Natasha's ability to show how all these things are connected and work in tandem to suspend and monetize the gambler's attention. Now that I offer so much applause to, for her book is perhaps less important than mentioning the praise that every year my students give it. I use two, book, two chapters of her book in my classes and without failing, my students not only love them, but engage with them in interesting and very kind of generative and productive ways. For those who teach regularly, you'll know that this is indeed the highest form of praise. I actually really, I mean, I, I, I hope my students are here today because I cannot tell you, Natasha, how much they actually really enjoy and how productive the discussions are that we have in class. Natasha's current book is called Keeping Track and it explores the rise of sensor-based digital technologies of the self and the new modes of introspection, self-care and self-regulation that these technologies offer. Today, we are privileged in that Natasha will be telling us a bit about this forthcoming book. And I am certain that this little peek will only increase our will to read the book when it comes out. I will definitely be looking forward to it. So without further ado, let me introduce Natasha and again tell you how really 
generous of you with us to be here today and how grateful we are that we can uh, we can listen to your talk today. So the floor is yours, Natasha. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here. And um, I absolutely agree about the highest form of praise. Um, I am always so gratified to hear that students are um, reading and engaging with my work, which I must admit, I have never taught myself. Um, I found that when I do that, there's a sort of silence um, because I'm the person who wrote it, but I love hearing about when other people teach it. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so today, um, I would like to talk about the second book project. Um, I will say a couple words about how the first project led into the second one. Um, but as, as you've already heard, um, I'm an anthropologist. I spent eight years in an STS department. Um, now I work in a media studies department. Um, and a, a very general way to characterize my work is to say that I'm always um, seeking clues to broader existential political economic predicaments through the, a sort of close empirical and ethnographic account um, of the interplay between design and the use of technology. So that, that carries across to this current project. Um, I have given versions of this talk um, a couple times, so apologies to those who may have already seen it. Um, so just to link it to my book, um, and maybe some people on this call, some students are familiar with it. Um, uh, you gave a great gloss already, but um, the, the, I, I can just say how this book examined at many different levels of design, um, you know, not just the audio visuals and the mathematical algorithms of the games themselves, but also these elements of architecture and um, ergonomics and the sort of atmosphere of the casino were, were all being harnessed to reduce gamblers' critical thinking capacities and suspend them in this kind of machine zone, which is their term. Um, and in that machine zone, their attention is so focused on the task at hand that they become inattentive to the passage of time, uh, to the value of money, and they remain kind of caught in this gamified loop of repetition for extended periods. And of course, that, um, as, as we well know from um, looking at websites and the platform, that increases the revenue that, they, that, that these players generate for the house. Um, and this, this book experienced um, a kind of second life that I hadn't anticipated when I wrote it in the sense that many of the strategies that I outlined, and um, you know, it was a long time that I was doing this, you know, way before um, iPhones you know, existed. Um, and when the book came out, the, I forget if it was which update of the iPhone, but the one that really brought it sort of into our pockets and at our fingertips in this, this new and intense way had been out for a few years. And you saw these emerging conversations around um, the sort of techniques for hooking and holding attention that I saw flourishing in Las Vegas casinos um, and that how those were carrying over to smartphones, social media, games like Candy Crush, um, and other interactive platforms. So I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A, but that's the general context for um, turning my attention um, elsewhere. So um, I turn my attention to so-called self-tracking technologies. And th this is a category that includes smartphone apps and wearable devices, software programs. It's a, it's a genre of technology um, that, uh, on the face of it, here's the link, you know, would, would seem designed to counteract or protect against precisely the kinds of attention absorption that I wrote about in the 2012 book, um, around which there has been so much recent public and academic attention. This really is a, um, a very hot, sexy word, uh, you know, attention and attention studies, um, so on and so forth. Um, so this first wave of self-tracking technology, it occurred to me as I kind of um, moved away from the first book, um, was designed not to keep us zoned out and unself-attentive, but rather to keep us attentive um, to mundane but very consequential tiny acts of daily existence, our physical movement, our eating habits, the way we spend our money, 
stress levels. Um, in other words, to serve as a kind of compass. Um, and what I want to do here, I've titled this talk from compass to sentinel, is trace a shift that I've detected in the recent history of this technology um, from what I'm calling the compass logic to a sentinel logic, which is uh, a trajectory toward increasing automation that I think is very telling of um, so many problematics of digital capitalism. Um, I just want to pause and say that to, to fully make sense of that trajectory, I would need to speak not only about the design side, but also the very rich user side of the story. And I absolutely do that in the book, but I don't have time to focus on that here today. Um, so again, q and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, so just to dive right into it, uh, my research began um, in the quantified self group. Um, this is a, uh, a, a group that is associated with this tagline self knowledge through numbers. Um, of course, you know, analog devices like clocks and mirrors and diaries and scales and wristwatches, thermometers, we've always had technology to help us keep track of our bodily processes, our use of time, even our moral of psychological states. You can think of things like diaries or mood rings, right? But the past decade, um, maybe coming up on more than a decade now, has seen this, this dramatic increase in self-tracking as consumers are offered these relatively affordable digital technology and software applications. Um, again, in large part because of the iPhone, uh, you know, putting at our fingertips the uh, techniques and technologies with which we can record, reflect on, and regulate ourselves. Um, <clears throat> so one place where this began happening, the sort of early adopters, was the quantified self community. I, I'll refer to it as QS also. Um, this is an international collective. It unsurprisingly emerged in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I started researching it in um, sort of the Boston, Massachusetts, MIT area, which was another hot spot in the early days. And small groups of very savvy, technologically savvy individuals would gather and reflect on what, what could we learn about ourselves? You know, this is the question of data and us, right? Um, from data gathering devices and analytical software about you know, the, 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 the sort of mysteries and dynamics and challenges of our day to day lives, like drug side effects, sleep disorders, um, <laughs> the relationship between diet and productivity. <laughs> Again, the idea is self knowledge through numbers. The emphasis was placed on self knowledge, um, also by the journalistic uptake of this. You see that in these headlines know thyself, know thyself. Um, one longtime tracker told me um, it's about introspection, reflection, seeing patterns, and arriving at realizations about who you are and how you might change. So it's almost a very self-cultivating, you know, aesthetic, um, even human, humanist kind of practice um, in interaction with data, you know, as it was conceived in the early days of quantified self. Um, the ethos was very do it yourself, take charge of your own data design your own algorithms and tracking systems. This is not riddled with the kind of pr uh, privacy issues that you see um, in, in so when, when this stuff gets taken to market and platformized. However, um, and, I, and I found that refreshing having come off of my first project, I was still so interested in this relationship between design and use and with the idea of tracking. Uh, but I was a little bit demoralized by having spent so much time looking at this, this sort of top-down manipulation and revenue extraction. But pretty quickly in the early days of um, this project, this new kind of person started showing up at the meetings, typically sitting in the back and taking notes. And they were not there to put their own lives at stake and think about their own data. They were there to... Um, try to monetize this formula and take it to market. And they, they got, um, no one knows who, who invented the word, but quantrepreneur is how they were um, called. And so as part of my research, I decided to follow them. So uh, follow the movement of self-tracking out of quantified self and into such places 
as the aisles of Best Buy, the physical aisles, but also online. Here you see um, the online marketplace Amazon, which in 2014 launched this new specialty shop for wearable technology. It, it's since no longer there because you no longer really need a shop to promote and describe to people because it has become, this technology has become so saturated, right? In all of our lives, we all kind of, most people get it and understand it, but here you probably can't read it. But there was a whole kind of pedagogical um, guide that accompanied this that would say, um, what might you use this for? Do you need help remembering to exercise? You know, sort of prompting and priming the market. Um, and I also went uh, for a number of consecutive years to the Consumer Electronics Show or CES, um, which is how I ended up full circle back to Vegas in the same um, exposition halls that I had been in for my research on um, addictive gaming technologies. So, in 2013, um, I think that's the year I started attending the CES, QS really was the model for what self-tracking to mark, you know, consumer grade self-tracking technology should look like and how it should operate. Um, here's a Forbes article um, christening the, the, the Consumer Electronics Show that year, the, the year of quantified self. Um, and here you see uh, a, uh, a uh, quote that it's about consciously keeping track of your choices so that this is definitely the compass logic that it's you with this stuff in hand or on wrist or around the neck but you can look at it consult the screen and know yourself better uh one presenter at an expo panel um the in in 2015 um, described the aim of self-tracking as being um, building a profile or picture of what it is you're doing. And this lets you see, I'm quoting, you know, and understand the choices you're making all day long, whether to take the stairs or the elevator, what you will eat or not eat. Um, you, uh, you have to see how your choices are impacting you, see how the gauges are moving as you make choices. That, that, that's, um, that was really the logic here, right? Again, a compass logic. So the, the self-tracking subject is figured in these early days as a rational, self-aware choice maker um, and technology figures as a support to that subject and a way to combat behavior that is automatic and unself-aware. So almost an anti-slot machine, if you will, um, with different monetization <laughs> strategies. Um, following that logic, here you see Fitbit wearers who are consulting their dashboards very much like digital compasses for modern living. They're out and about, they're in parking lots, they're on their way to a meeting, they're exercising, they're navigating this kind of tempting and sometimes confounding landscape um, and sometimes toxic landscape of everyday choice making and lifestyle management. Um, up here in the, in, the, in the corner, you see daily decisions that add up to big results. So these minute little things, a step, a bite, you know, a, a, an extra degree of temperature, um, th these small quotidian uh, entities, you know, really are um, what is being focused on and added up by this big data gaze of the device, um, so as to increase our self-attention and self-knowledge. And I'm just going to play, and there's no sound, I'll talk over it, um, a relatively early video for the Fitbit, which was, um, you know, maybe the, mo the most popular um, of these early wrist trackers. Um, it embodies this kind of information provision and self-knowledge logic. Um, so the camera um, shows someone, um, or here, going about his life. Um, it suggests that they can trust the devices they wear. Here, here's a man um, walking along. Uh, you'll see in a moment a man paused at the turnstile of the subway entrance. Um, well, in, the, in this particular moment, the woman's outside sort of playing, but inside every, she trusts the machine to be taking all of this um, into account for her. 
he's facing this decision. Does he take the Metro or does he walk? And he decides based on the guidance of his Fitbit that he is going to walk instead. Um, so you see that the device must be consulted by the wearer, but it does start to have its own agency and epistemology. It works even when people are asleep, right? So she's not consulting it. It's not, it, it's a compass that isn't being really looked at. It's kind of working in the background. Um, it helps to optimize even inactivity. So we start to see in the, the design and uh, the advertisement of the technology itself, a, a slight shift in, in logic, which I didn't really pick up on in the early days. Um, I don't have my animations on, so I'm just gonna pull this image down um, or to the side, maybe not. Um, okay, uh, this is a quote from the 2015 Consumer Electronics Meeting um, where you started to have this turn in the conversation. It wasn't about data, data, self-knowledge through numbers, numbers, quantification. It started to be about consumers um, being overwhelmed or discouraged by seeing their numbers, overwhelmed by their data, a kind of data exhaustion from all the data exhaust, if you will, um, and that the work of designers should be to turn away from this full, extensive, exhaustive and exhausting information provision toward meaningful insight. So here we have, you know, we're gathering 5,000 data points a minute off the body. You and I can't deal with that much. We have to trickle it into meaningful insights so that we can have understanding. Um, so, so essentially this is a turn away from quantification toward de-quantification. Um, this same CEO said, um, old school products show a number um, but the next generation will simply tell you how you're doing. You have improved 10%. They will give you personalized direction and meaning. Um, I heard about scales, weighing scales, you know, that are all, have always been associated with, you know, what's your weight? What's your number? But these new scales dispensed with numbers um, and you would stand on it and it would simply show you a smiley face, maybe with a confirming vibration on your feet to show you your you're in your range, you know, let's not obsess about some little deviation this way or that way. Um, you know, you're, you're on track. Uh, so you see this language and logic of self-tracking products shifting in degrees away from you knowing yourself toward the device knowing you. And so you see that here in this image. Um, this device can know me better than I know myself and help me to be a better human. So as we'll see in the remainder of my talk, it's going to shift further away from knowledge altogether toward a more automated and frictionless kind of guidance um, in which you don't always know even when you are being guided. So, um, you know, it's still, it's still a project of self-knowledge, but one, one that is shifting um, and be, be, being given more aspects of it are being given over to um, the epistemological authority of these devices. So I'm just going to quickly run through, you know, this is a sort of overview of the arc, argumentative arc of my book. So what, what will be in the book extended over many chapters, I'm just sort of dropping in on um, in this talk. So I'll give you a taste of these technologies um, through which I have uh, detected this, this shift. Um, so here we have um, technologies that are, aren't really meant to increase awareness of patterns and rhythms, um, but again, to um, guide us. For instance, we have the, the, the jawbone up, wristband. This was the first to vibrate when you've been idle too long. So uh, you could set it if I, I've been inactive or sitting in the same position for 10 minutes, um, vibrate and tell me that I should stand up or move. Um, here we have a more recent posture technology. It's a little thing that sits on your chest and it straightens your back um, without interrupting your workflow. So it does not require you to reflect, um, you know, as, as a sort of reflexive self-knowing subject and make a decision to straighten your back. It just buzzes you through these haptic act actuators um, without interrupting you. And, um, the, the, the literature says through the app, control when you're buzzed, how you're buzzed, and even how intensely it buzzes. So you do have some control in setting it up 
but once it's on, it operates. Here you've got the spire. The spire is this um, small stone-like device um, that you can clip onto your bra strap or your pants, and it helps you regulate your breath um, by extension, your stress levels. So it alerts you, um, and I had this for a while, but it was just too, too annoying um, for me. It was too interruptive actually of my work because I'm more interested in the, in the idea behind it than whether it actually works across the board, I should say, with all of this. But it would suddenly um, buzz me and I'd look at my phone and it would say, you're in a tense streak, time for a deep breath. Your you're, you, you're, you're breathing is very shallow. Um, here we have another one very similar to that. So it's about breath and posture. Uh, and this, so these, this genre of wearable technologies, they're communicating with you at the, at the point of purchase, so to speak. So it's, it's calling you to attention at the moment when action is required to get you back on trap and it, track and it's sort of happening very instantaneously. So you could, with all of these devices I'm talking about, um, you can still on in compass mode, review your collected data, reflect on your past behavior, make your own decisions about future behavior. You can be a subject sort of in with, with temporal perspective, but doing that is increasingly optional. And this is really designed for a subject that is immersed, living their life, eating lunch, working at a desk, um, without the space or breathing room to do that reflection. So you just sort of dispense with self-reflection for a buzz, um, which in some cases is more like a shock. Um, with the Apple Watch, they call it taps. So you put on haptic alerts, but that is their taptic engine because it will tap on your wrist um, instead of signaling you with beeps and chimes. It will give you, it says, get a feeling for what's going on. And so for instance, you could select a walking destination on a map and head off. And then you can have a conversation. You can have your head up looking about. You don't need to navigate. You don't need to look at your map. You don't need to look at your compass. Um, it will buzz or give you a gentle tap when it's um, time to turn left or a different kind of tap when it's time to turn right. Um, here's one that comes closer to an actual shock. Um, this is a smart utensil, and here the concern is with the pace of eating. So it tracks your eating by sensing and monitoring um, two parts of the body in time, your hand and your mouth. You know, it can measure that this is happening and, it, and what is the time in which that's happening. So this is not about what you are eating. It is about the speed of your eating, it's purely the behavior of, of eating, not the content. Um, so it's this kind of closed electric circuit. And when, uh, here, here's an example. Again, you don't have to even look at your phone because the fork is acting on you directly, but this is what's going on, right? So she's eating with her friends, they're talking. She's not in compass mode at all. Um, and it is timing her. And if she takes another bite, you know, if this gesture happens in under 10 seconds, she will get oops too fast. And what happens, <laughs> is um, it, the, the, the tines of the fork, the metal parts of the fork are vibrating on her teeth, which is a very unpleasant sensation. Um, the, the instruction booklet says, you are advised to take 10 to 20 chews. If you trigger the alarm by eating too fast, don't panic, set the fork down at the side of the plate, wait till the light turns green, signaling that it's safe to take another bite. So, you know, it's, the, the very mundane act, not of even the whole meal, but each bite is turned into this issue of panic and safety, you know, because it's all, we, we, we can just look, look downstream to the, the heart attacks and the, the weight gain and the diabetes, you know, the idea is that the, this little device um, and its datification of our eating is um, going to save us really from ourselves. Um, so this slow eating agenda of the fork, um, you know, prompted the comedian Stephen Colbert to remark, you know, what is the point of consumer technology that keeps you from consuming? Frankly, it's un-American. Um, and I, I bring this, this bit of humor in because it would seem to be un-American in another sense as well. 
if you consider the long tradition um, in, in the US um, of self-help approaches that emphasize the cultivation of inner restraint and self-control and the rejection of reliance on external forces. So external forces, whether they are paternalistic governmental figures nudging us or whether they are technological like the fork. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that I think that the story I'm telling about this shift from compass to sentinel logic in the case of self-tracking technology um, is a broader story, right? Of a, of a turn to automation and a gradual moving away from um, the, this sort of um, moral, um, this moral code of inner restraint and self-control. It's becoming increasingly okay to rely on things, whether it's the internet of things um, or algorithms to guide us, um, which, it, which is I think really worth thinking about. Um, so a relevant bit of uh, historical reference here would be um, this progressive era fad of Fletcherism. It was called the Choo Choo Cult and it was a method of eating by Horace Fletcher. Um, and he said, you have to deliberately chew your food mindfully and deliberately um, from 30 to 100 times a minute, depending on the substance so that it pretty much turned to liquid before you swallowed it. Um, he was known as the great masticator and he basically promised followers the exact same benefits that um, the makers of Happy Fork promise. Uh, including regulation of weight gain, digestive problems, acid reflux. Um, and he also didn't care what it was you were eating, right? He was content agnostic. Um, but the, a critical aspect, the critical aspect of his system was counting, quantifying, paying attention to your own chewing, right? You had to be aware without the support or entrainment of a device. So the question, why not? Why aren't we doing it Fletcher's way today? Um, and as it happens, right at the top of the list of frequently asked questions on the Happy Fork page, um, there is this question. If I want to eat more slowly, can't I do this by myself? Um, the response that Happy Fork offers, I think demonstrates the degree to which an environment of distraction is today the, the expected and accepted context for eating. And, you know, we can extend that to slouching or any number of the things that we're doing in our busy life. Um, so that they go on and say, when we want to control the pace at which we're eating, we have to focus on counting the bites or watching the time. When we're sharing a meal with friends or being distracted by TV, you know, totally, totally accepted, it's very difficult to remain conscious of the pace at which we're, we're eating. Um, so the fork basically is leaving our ears, our eyes free to and our minds, you know, to come, to attend to whatever compelling stimuli absorbs us, and instead it's it's relaying its nudges at the site of the mouth that has you know bitten too soon. So it's paying attention for us in this sentinel manner, um, and it, it moving from a sort of sight based reflective compass logic where you need to see to know. Uh, to more of a sort of cattle prod where you're, you're vibrated or nudged or buzzed. Um, so just moving toward conclusion, I want to um, I want to ask, you know, what kind of attention is this that we are being kind of, you know, nudged toward this, this attention that the device is paying for us, right? Um, so the, the biofeedback um, gadgets of an earlier era were meant to make explicit. So if we think to the 1970s and biofeedback, neurofeedback, and great work has been done in, in um, STS on this. Um, the point was to make explicit our own physiological signals in a way that it becomes more noticeable to us, right? So it shifts attention to our internal processes raises our awareness, and then we can self-adjust, um, even like meditation or yoga, right? So there's a different model of attunement in, in the kinds of technologies that I have looked at here, I think. 
Um, you know, there's nothing in Happy Fork or the Lumo Lift posture pin or the Apple Watch. There's nothing in these technologies that say um, that you can't sit down and use it as a training device, take off and put away and go out into the world on your own. Um, but there's no suggestion, you know, that you should do that, or there's there's no promise that you will learn to eat self attentively and so that you can eventually put it away and stop using it. Um, the logic is one of ongoing dependency on these these haptic actuations um, of the device. So you know, actuation, the, the vibration, these haptic vibrators is is the the kind of term. But I think. It, uh, you know, I, we can play with that term that maybe this is a subject that doesn't self actualize, but you know, that they're being self actuated right in in the moment. So um, it's very abrupt and discontinuous. So you're having an experience and these buzzes and shocks and being, you know, they, they fracture this flow of experience. Um, and th their point is not to cultivate ongoing self attention, but to snap you to momentary attention actuated attention, I call it, and then kind of release you back to this unself attentive, unvigilant, unnoticing state, which is considered by all these products to be a, fi a perfectly fine, you know, moral state to be in. You know, there, 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 there is a sort of retreat from the day of, from the days of Fletcher and so many others, right? Um, so here is a quote from, I think it was South by Southwest, which also has a lot of, always has a lot of showcases and panels on this self-tracking technology. And this is a, a health technology designer and longtime self-tracker, Leslie Ziegler. And she says, I don't want to track. I want it to be done for me. Insert a chip in my mouth and have it record the calories for me. And you know, this is really seen as the holy grail when it comes to um, the, the issue of literal consumption and, and eating. But again, um, you know, people do not want to add more self-regulative labor to their lives. They want devices that work for them. And it seems to me that this array of sentinel devices, you know, serve this prosthetic function. And they, what they do is they allow us to remain at once distracted, absorbed consumers, right? Uh, continuing on in our consumption, which is very morally valued um, and, allow us to be consumer sovereigns who are in charge and attentive of our own behavior. So they sit on our bodies and they sort of play the role of the, the, the sovereign role, um, which is taken out of the, the human who's just kind of let to just act and eat um, in this unfettered way. So it's a, it, you know, there's something contradictory there, but it's an attempt I see at reconciling that. I guess just to, to totally wind up um, I'll say that what, what prompted me in this direction was not just these haptic actuator devices, but others that started to appear on the shelves next to them that really confused me because there was literally no tracking going on at all, but they were placed on, on as sort of the next iteration um, of this more automated logic. Here is one where you put it on your head and I, I participated in the beta trials for this. Um, and then you choose whether you want to uh, relax, like calm vibes, or whether you want vi uh, the energized vibes. And you don't need to do anything, which also confused me in the beta testing. I said, do you want me to sit still? Do you want me to do something in the computer? And they're like, oh, no, do whatever you want. You can go get a coffee. You can read. You can have a phone call. It was acting utterly independently of me. So the self, if you want to use this. AI kind of idea of the self in the loop. The self is really not in the loop here, except the action of putting it on um, her head. Uh, and the, the very last one, which I can't resist uh, bringing up because it so well captures this externalization of responsibility to technology. Um, here is um, the sense mother. And I should say both think, the makers of think and the makers of sense mother directly um, challenge the Fitbit compass logic when they speak about their product. They say, why do we need something that tells us what we should do? Let's make things that just do it for us.
right? Like re re relax us. We don't want to meditate. We want to get in an Uber and put this thing on our heads so we're relaxed or energized when we arrive at our job interview, et cetera. So here is mother. Um, if, if at first it was about know thyself, I'll explain how she works. Um, now it is about an all-knowing mother who, who knows everything. Mother knows everything. So mother works through these sensor um, sensors called motion cookies that you see, and you'll put it on like your, um, your, your refrigerator, your pillbox, your water bottle. So it's, this is where the self tracking, which is now keeping yourself on track or the technology, keeping you on track. It's not knowing about yourself. Right. But the technology, the, these little devices are no longer necessarily sitting on us they are merging with the internet of things and they are sitting on our refrigerator. They are sitting on the water bottle. Um, they are sitting under our mattress. You can put one of these things and they call us to attention, whether it's when it's time to brush our teeth, take take a sip of water. Um, it, the, the literature tells us the sensors will blend into your life and adapt to your behavior with re requiring any effort training or care from you. So it, it, it's sort of suggesting that self-care in the self-tracking formula that we started with in the quantified self is being replaced by what we could maybe call algorithmic care, which is a logic of care where friction, any kind of friction where you have to look and attend and do something yourself is so minimized that the user drops out of the loop um, and the device simply does it for you. So what we're what we're seeing, um, and what I'm tracing in, the, in this book that I'm finishing up now is this turn toward increasing automation, um, and this sort of merger with Internet of Things with the smart home. Um, it's true that to self track, to, to even think about this technology means that you heavily value your choices and behavior. You know, you're not the slot machine addict. You want to stay in the game. You want to be responsible. So there is a buy-in for sure to an ethos of personal responsibility and a logic of care, but it also expresses a desire not to be in charge. You know, it's a desire for, for care from the technology, um, which pre presents this kind of solution to, to that desire. Um, so I think I will just end there. You know, I could, I could, I could go on, but I think that's that's a nice stopping point to maybe open to, to a few questions. Thank you, Natasha. <laughs> um, so uh, for everyone, you can post your questions, and I'll I'll read them aloud. But I'll start this off. Uh, so first, uh, thanks. I loved it. Um, but I have a question. I I did my PhD on wearable computers, um, two thousands. Yes, and, already... and you wrote you wrote one of the founding, um, you know, where where papers on wearable technology with um, with Lucy Suchman, right? That was so right. important to, to me in the beginning. Right. So part of what 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 interests me is that this logic of or this tension that you spoke about about you know, being caring for oneself, so having your agency or being cared for by technology already existed then. And what I found really interesting, and perhaps you can talk a bit about this, is that in, in 2000, there was from, from the part of designers, attention being paid to ensuring that the user remained in charge, right? So yes, you were being helped. And yes, the technology was monitoring you. And yes, you were going to use it all day and it was going to know stuff about you. And it was going to know more about you than you know yourself. But at the end of the day, you are still in charge. And I'm wondering if you can say a bit about how this is working now, because it seems to me like it has shifted this discourse about you know, the whole thing about agency and how much, you know, we're intermingled and entangled. At that point, there was this effort to say, yes, we're entangled, but then at the end of the day, the human is in charge. So perhaps you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I am by no means an expert on contemporary sort of 
wearable computing, which which lives on, um, you know, sometimes um, at conferences in my research for this stuff, I will end up at sort of conferences or conventions that bring together people from different communities like like Steve Mann, right, who, um, or s some of the, um, there was one where Marvin Pinsky was there, uh, which was very exciting, like some of these figures, or Gordon Bell, these, fi these figures of sort of MIT Media Lab early forms of wearable commute computing, and they have a lot of overlap also with the quantified self, right, going back to the quantified self was started by two editors of Wired, magazine who could be considered part of this this community of geeks basically um, computer geeks and what I'm tracing and and that's what I sort of expected more to find in my research but with with the the quantrepreneurialization of the, of that um, ethos I think you, you you saw a waning of agency and you saw that for a number of reasons I mean, Here's where the users become quite important because it wasn't simply that um, that the designers were pushing this all by themselves, right? Just like in the book I wrote on Les, uh, there's a similar sort of turn where it isn't just the designers who are fully at the helm. You know, they they're always trying to extract as much revenue as possible, but they're very flexible and working with all of the data they're getting back from their customers to hone their formula for sort of technological capture. And sometimes they don't know what direction their consumers like one machine more than another, and so that's the one they iterate on. So there is, to some extent, I'm not saying that the users are in control here of the, the development, but they certainly responded in ways that um, didn't dictate, but played a big role in this turn toward automation. And that's why every year when I went back to the Consumer Electronics Show, you'd have like a new year of data from the user base. Who was buying what? How were they using it or not using it? Was it failing or not? So it wasn't this small sort of geek community um, who really were remaining as, as um, their own agents and putting these machines on in this cyborg fashion. Um, this was, users who really did not like fiddling around um, and looking at their, their, they weren't turned on by their data, right, in the way that quantified self people were. And that was sort of every year at the Consumer Electronics Show on these big um, panels, right, people would discuss this and they, they learned every year, like, you know what, we thought that this technology was quantified self, but let's not call it that. Most people don't want to quantify themselves. They don't want to look at their data. So it's a complicated answer that I, that I could give, but I think it has a lot to do with the sort of mass market um, marketization of this and the, the where revenue failed to come in because people just weren't using it in certain ways and how it got shaped in other ways. Sorry. Okay, so uh, we have a question from Kelly Gates. She says, do you look at meditation apps in this research? Does meditation and mindfulness itself become subsumed within the sentinental, sentinel logic? I love that question. Um, I recently finished um, an article that will be in some distributed way in the book, but it focuses um, very specifically on technologies that are addressing um, attention and how to sort of train your attention. And some of them, and what I argue in that paper, which is a point I didn't quite get to make here, so I really, I, I value this opportunity to make this point, um, is that you, th this is all very unsettled. This is all very up for grabs, right? It, it isn't the case that, okay, we're just, going on this destination to automation and nothing, nothing else exists. There are many, this is, this is a, a moment of, um, you know, to use STS language, this has not yet been domesticated fully, the, this logic. And you can find sitting on the same shelf in the stress section, um, you know, a meditation app or device, and I'll, I'll give the example of the Muse brain sensing headband. You can find it sitting next to um, 
Think's latest iteration. Think was the thing you saw the woman in the Uber, you know, with, with the thing on her head. Now that is a patch that you put behind your ear. It's an energy, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of brain interface energy patch that shifts your attention and makes you focus. Um, you find things in development where you can use it in the classroom or at work. Um, it lives in your eyeglasses and it can tell, it can read from your brain when your attention is wandering. And it will, again, the glasses will buzz on your head to get you back on tension. And so what I do in this paper is I break down the logic behind each of these. You know, we could put them on the shelf. We could say, this is part of this monolith of self-tracking technology under which there's like this mini monolith of attention where things like meditation and haptic act, it's all being subsumed and mixed up into the same thing. And I really wanna resist that because I think there are, when you delve into the logics behind these different devices sitting next to each other, right? They're really quite different. Um, the, the subject that is being addressed by the muse, for instance, um, is a subject who puts aside the device. You only use it in the morning to train yourself and then you put it away and you go out into the world. So it's much more like a yoga class or kind of biofeedback training module um, where really the, the, the person is cultivating this and developing this muscle for themselves. So it's almost like an athlete kind of subject. Then you look at the patch behind the ear and the way it works, and it seems to be addressing a patient, you know, somebody who just, it's more pharmacological. You put it on, mm -hmm. it acts on you, you get your focus back. Then you've got more of the sort of punitive, almost panopt, like the mini panopticon that's sitting on you watching and sort of disciplining you and buzzing you when your attention begins to wander. Um, I know you asked specifically about meditation and not necessarily attention and stress, but these things, um, sort of bleed into one another in the self-tracking domain. And I take comfort in the fact that um, it's hard to subsume them all under one logic and that there are differences and possibilities that we can discern for you know, alternative futures or developments. So I don't want anyone to leave this talk thinking that I am anti-self-tracking technology or that we are destined to go in this one all-consuming sort of automation direction. Okay, we have a few more questions. I should, I should have said that uh, Kelly started by thanking for the great talk and everyone um, is doing the same. So Katerina Gatto says, all of these uses represent a lot of opportunities for brands. How can this relationship between the data collectors and the brands work? Uh, and then she talks about the, the, the importance of respecting data policies, which uh, as you know, in, in Europe is, is a big thing. So it's about how can this, how is this relationship between the, the data collection and the brands, the companies that produce them, how does it work? How is it working? Yeah, that, that is an excellent question. It's actually, you know, and it's a very obvious, you know, I, I don't mean to undermine the question in any way. It, it's very obvious because it is a good question. It's the first thing that comes to mind. It's usually one of the first questions that I get in talks. And it is at the same time um, difficult for me to answer because I'm not coming at it. There's so much to talk about here. And there's so many people working on the, the sort of privacy uh, design or transparency issues, policy issues with respect to data technology and gathering, you know, as I did in my first book with the, the invariant, I have a whole chapter on the very intensive sort of data tracking of casino patrons, which is then sort of used against them to extract further revenue and how this violates all manner of privacy and boundaries. It's very exploitative, right? And so the thread that I am tracing here is really more about focusing on what are the experiential, phenomenological, sort of intimate and affective relationships that we have with the technologies. And to be honest, I have not found a way yet to um, not even elegantly, but um, at all integrate 
the great importance of you know the question you ask with this other thread that I'm looking at. Uh, because the truth is that that stuff does not come up in my interviews very much. It didn't come up in quantified self um, it, in that way because they are so fiercely about their own privacy and owning their own data. And what you see happening is as it goes out to market, suddenly there's people who can't design their own algorithms, who don't understand how this works, who want you know, this thing to do stuff for them. And, um, you know, unfortunately, don't take seriously the incursions on on their privacy and the way that their own data can be bought, sold, exploited. So this absolutely goes on, um, and it, and it's important. And I will talk about it in my book in some fashion as something that as an important undercurrent to all of this. That's absolutely motivating. You know why they don't just zappy fork as something you use to learn. They could have made it a learning tool, right? And then you put it away. But they want, you know, what I call data for life. They want to be constant. They want you to wear it always because the data itself is very important to them and their further iterations of algorithms, um, and and what have you. So, um, absolutely, that's going on. But again, it is not going on um, in the totalizing way that we might think. For instance, if you look at the the policy of the Muse device. Um, they, they are very, very attentive and there's like different levels that you can sign up on. Like, do you want your data to be in anonymized form, to be aggregated, to help us iterate the next model of like reading your brain waves? Um, maybe you don't want your data even aggregated in, anon in this anonymous form. Maybe you just want it for yourself. Fine, we'll put a wall around it. So there are ways to do this that don't violate policy. Most of these companies um, aren't following those. And I will, I will bring that up as part of this story of their strategy to get more revenue. So we have a, a question from Adriana Gonçalves, and she says she asks if you think, and this is comes back again to the question of to the of users, uh, do you think that people are happy with all the possibilities or, or are they already apprehensive about the amount of data that is being collected? And then she continues saying, are there more benefits or more risks for us in these wearable technologies? And finally, she asks if everything will be quantified. <laughs> well, um, so that there's a lot of questions in there. Um, just starting with the last one, I think what I've what I've shown here is that everything may be quantified by you know in the background, but it's not necessarily going to be quantified for us. There's this interesting dequantification, right, where we're not we're not seeing the seams of our data and our numbers any anymore. There's a retreat from that because it's thought that people are a little bit um, exhausted by by the data, um, and I think that with this turn to automation, you know, is it, is it good? Is it bad? Like, again, I'm, I'm not here. I, I'm more about trying to discern in the swirl of this stuff that um, increasingly dwells among us. We, we dwell through it and, you know, in it. Um, what from that might, might we recuperate or salvage um, that leads more toward kind of flourishing than it does toward, um, harm and i guess i take inspiration i'm not i'm not a i'm not a big stiglerian but stiegler does have um some aspects to his work that i really appreciate um that i think are pretty rare um he's known as someone who uh sees technology right as this kind of he could he could be easily misinterpreted as someone who sees technology as this sort of automating addictive bad thing right but he allows that if we look closely at the technology, aspects of it are wonderful for, um, for our sociality, for our self-cultivation. For instance, he was a big fan of the Facebook chat, right? He in social media, hated the gamification and all of these little loops that we're driven into. And yet the the chat function where people can talk to each other from around the world have moments of spontaneous humor etc mm -hmm. this in his mind allowed the kind of breathing room 
the kind of circuit or design of a loop um, that actually is maybe a good. And so again, I tried to end on this note of um, with each technology we look at, like the ones you see up on the screen, there's plenty more um, asking of it, what kind of loop is this technology, whether it's you know, the Muse headband or the energy patch or the happy fork, where does the human come into the loop? Are they given breathing room in any reflective space at all, right? Um, is this is this 100% sentinel automatic? Is it, you know, without privileging one or the other, but you know, what 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 is a sort of mix of the 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 human and the machine? Um, because we are technological creatures, right? What is a mix that that does lead to greater flourishing? So I guess that would be the way I'd answer mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Um, Elise uh, Zing uh, says that she's uh, studying self-tracking for her PhD, and she has found the kind of disconnect that you were talking about earlier. So a disconnection between the market logic and the user's logic, especially those apps that try to give a score of exercise, diet, or sleep. She continues saying, transparency seems to be an issue and users find it hard to understand. How do you then see this interaction between algorithms and users, between the you know the, the kinds of uh, results, I guess that that um, that the apps produce and what the users are looking for? So um, some of that disappointment. So for some of my research, I would I would hang out in actual electronic stores and I would sort of approach people that I noticed were in that kind of trance of considering a product and ima imagining themselves wearing it and they had all this promise. Um, and then I would also track the, the, the comments on like Amazon and other uh, mm -hmm. purchasing sites where um, people were so furious and angry because it did not give them what they wanted. They were so crushed and disappointed. It was like the cruel optimism of this stuff just came to the fore. They were very vocal about it. And I think with regard specifically to this disjuncture between the scores that um, or the recommendations that may be given by the device and what a person sort of, let's call it intuitively feels, right? Um, I'm actually sympathetic to, to one answer that the designers might give, which is that um, a lot of the time it's just bad technology and badly designed. Um, I'm, I'm where I don't want to do an advertisement, but I'm wearing the Ura ring here. Um, and I, I absolutely understand because of the way that it's designed and communicates with me, um, how, how its readiness score is being formulated. Um, I also know that if I get a readiness score of 69, or I think today was 73, which is based on um, temperature, my heart rate, my heart rate variability, how many hours I slept, um, my recovery, you know, from walking up the stairs, how quickly does my heart settle back down. Despite that, I have done some of my best writing or sort of risen to the challenge of um, like today I have two talks to give um, and I'm doing that on 69. Um, whereas the days that I get 93 or 98, I can be a little spacey and out of it. So I'm not angry at the device. I understand why it's generating this. I find it very interesting and curious. Maybe I'm a geek at heart um, that there is that disjuncture. Maybe I would be more sort of pissed off if I wasn't a geek and just wanted, just wanted to know like, why is it telling me this one thing when I feel like I slept great? You know, it could be that the algorithm just isn't there yet. Um, none of this stuff. I find it an interesting net to think against by, by looking, I, I like the compass logic. I mean, which should be clear, which is that you reflect against your data and a lot can ha happen in that reflective moment. The self is definitely in the loop there. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to sync up perfectly. I, I'd say that though, perhaps what, what Elise is aiming at, which is something that I tried when uh, very early on uh, a device to help me track my sleep, is that the companies are very kind of secretive about the algorithms that they use in order to provide those results, right? So 
when you get a score, is it your score? What average is this based on? I mean, that kind of stuff can be really hard to understand, right? Yes, but most most of these sites um, have um, a sort of forum, the, mm -hmm. the, the, like Whoop or Aura or even Zio. And uh, once again, the people who really delve down into the details, um, it, you can find information there about how it's done um, and what the average is made of and how the, what are the differences okay. between the way WHOOP calculates a score versus um, the way that something else does. You know, the, the polar heart rate monitor gives very different heart rate variability scores on their own kind of metric from like one to nine versus URA, which is a different metric. So the information I think is out there about what it, what this brings to the to the fore in most cases, right? In most, sometimes it's just not. It's like this box, right? Like around the slot machines, you will not know how I'm making the the algorithm inside. Mm -hmm. um, but I think some people don't even want that transparency. They're like, I don't even want to know how you are doing, right? Don't. Why are you forcing me to look at and evaluate and learn this new language? I don't want to learn algorithms. I don't want to become data literate. I just need something to help me keep exercising and get off the couch. Mm -hmm. And I, I really value that expression. You know, this, this whole idea of transparency and data literacy and constant attention to privacy. I understand why that actually really does not um, line up with people's sort of orientation to the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Rui Miguel Coutinho starts by thanking you. And then he's, he asks for your perspective on smart cars and the so-called smart cities. Um, and he says, aren't those topics the opening or the possible opening of a Pandora box when it comes to surveillance? And he asks, you know, these, these, these technologies that we're using, smart cars, smart cities, um, could work with your local authorities to track and know your moves and I guess predict also as casinos do. Yeah. So what's your take on this? I would give the exact same answer that I gave to an earlier question, um, which is that, see, see we're, we're veering into the terrain, which is terrain that people are so interested in, but which I really do think many scholars are working on. So many scholars are working on issues of surveillance, policing, um, predictive policing, privacy, and that is one angle. So I'm not the person doing that research. I read it, I appreciate it, and I love it. Um, however, I'm taking it, I don't, I don't want to sort of get into that answer because what I'm doing is saying, what can we learn if we bracket that very important conversation? And actually go inside it, inside the experience, uh, inside the way things are designed the way they are for people who are having these data, intimate data experiences, um, and sort of dwell there. What might we learn there that actually allows us to more effectively critique um, you know, some, some of these other technologies that are, that are exploiting us, surveilling us, um, so on and so forth. So I guess, um, yeah, it's a, it is a great question, but that's not the angle that I that I am taking. And I, I am learning some things by dwelling in the experience and the pheno phenomenology that point to big problems with the way that we approach questions of, sur of surveillance and privacy, you know, which puts so much burden on people for policing their own boundaries and is rooted in like property law and notions of the individual that are very Western, right? Like you can do a critique of that approach. And so as an anthropologist, I am you know, going native in, in a sense and dwelling with this phenomenon rather than automatically critiquing it from the outside. I think that critique will be improved by doing that. Okay, um, my colleague Sophia Pont asks, about the user profiles that these devices rely upon, if you if you kind of can speak to that. Yeah, so um, it depends on the device. Some of these devices can sort of learn a specific user and adapt to them. 
um, others like the think that you see here, um, you know, that's on this person's head is really, um, you know, the, the, this sort of general subject and the way their brain waves work. And, you know, you can just be sort of you, human, there's this general kind of human and the algorithms of that device are designed for that. And it doesn't change or shift or there's no sort of learning going on. Um, with things like eating and the Fitbit, um, it's constantly changing. You can even, um, I've noticed that cropping up alongside all of this technology is this new kind of expert, um, an expert in the different types of users. So it's almost mm -hmm. like a Meyer Briggs type personality test where um, there are categories and they're usually like a, gr a cross and there's fourth and there's like, some consumers are social butterflies. They will respond really well to these this kind of programming. Um, they are very competitive. So if you want to get them to get up off the couch, mm -hmm. you know, that psychological profile has, you have to be aware of that and give them little incentives and competitive jabs, um, connect them to other people. Why are you on the couch? Um, others are not motivated at all by that, the competition and the social butterfly. They are more like they want a mother. They, they want the sentinel. They want a form of cigarette cessation where you are told by an app, you can have another cigarette now and I'll tell you when you can have your next one. Um, then there's, uh, there's the geek that's always in the mix with these kind of schema, schemas of, of user profiles. Someone who's really motivated and curious about reflecting on their own data. You know, there's, there's this assemblage and what I do detect is that there is a turn more toward the sentinel. The sentinel um, logic was not the logic followed by most of this stuff initially. It was more the logic of the sort of gamification logic for the, the, the people who needed competition, the, you know, the, the, the geeky logic, but not so much this automatic. And there, there's a sort of drift. And so I think you can say that there's then you can think about like what culturally, politically, economically is going on that would account for that sort of general drift in the sort of desire of the users. And I think it has to do with this data exhaustion. Again, we are putting off, giving off so much data. There's so much data exhaust out there. And we're sort of being asked to be these responsible subjects managing it all. And there's a sense of overwhelm. And please just give me something that helps me to manage all of this data. So uh, well, I will struck, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question now, uh, and then I'll, there's one more, and then we, we will slowly but surely finish. Gender dynamics, gender dimensions, have you noticed any? Because the use of the term mother is, uh, is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, this this turn toward the automatic and also the turn toward um, mother is one that even people in the um, the design world have noticed. Like there there was a there's a famous tweet where it seems like lately everything that's being designed in consumer technology is designed to do things that your mother once did for you, um, and so I do you know, give myself uh, author's liberty to play around a little bit with Winnicott and argue that, um, you know, just going off of my last answer on how, like, wh what are the larger sort of cultural dynamics or psychological dynamics going on here? Um, I think that part of this overwhelm is, um, and this retreat to a state where like, why is it that so many adults feel that it's okay and that they need help to remember to take a sip of things when they're thirsty, to eat at the proper pace, to sleep, now eating, sleep, breathing, right? Eating, sleeping, breathing, um, drinking. These are elemental aspects of survival that you really are supposed to learn to regulate yourself through you know, mothering or parental relationships, like almost in infancy. And there's this desire for something to tell us, like it's time for your feeding now, it's time to remind us. So 
it's like a retreat from the good enough mother, as Winnicott called her. And in his mind, the graduation to being an adult self in the world um, was pushed along by a mother who is not perfect. She is good enough. She will let you cry a little bit. In the beginning, she's perfect. You think she's part of you. You were merged. You're hungry and the breast is right there for you automatically, right? Like sense mother. But then she introduces friction and he, he describes mm -hmm. it as friction um, and frustration in her relations and in her response to you. She leaves you hungry a little bit because only by saying, hey, I am hungry. Can you become an I and learn how to navigate the world in a way that you can supply, you know, uh, hydration for yourself? So this is really how you become a self. The same with food, the same with relationships. And it really is fascinating to me that there's this sort of drift back to wanting a perfect mother yeah. because there's like too much friction and too much frustration. So in these like elemental ways, people seem to crave um, th this robot kind of um, who, who gives us what we need when we need it and knows more than we know about ourselves. Um, let me tell you, my kids, when he was a, uh younger whenever something someone offers him some food he would look at me and ask me do i like it mm -hmm. so that that reminds me a bit of what you're saying so uh, linda hoggle um who asked a former question has now and what will be our last question for today she asks how are you thinking about the shift from self-control to automated delegation to devices and the conditions of broader health concerns and then she says, for example, in your observations, has anything changed in terms of sentinel mentality and strategies since the pandemic, either in terms of product marketing on individuals participation with these devices? Or do you think people do you think people think of bodily habits and behaviors as distinct from vulnerability uh, from external sources? So she concludes saying, I'm thinking of the kinds of sentinel technologies and passive surveillance technologies being employed more broadly. Uh, so, yeah, since um, self-reporting. Yeah, so this is, a, hi, Linda. Um, Linda uh, has been in conversation with me at different junctures about this ah. <laughs> project. <laughs> um, and I'm, I, don't, I don't see your face, but I'm happy you're out there. Um, so I have decided uh, one, of, one of the things that has redeemed the fact that I'm still working on this. Um, one reason I'm still working on this is the pandemic, right? They did put a sort of a pause, but I was already going slowly. And I, I find it redeeming um, in a selfish way for my process of writing because it, may, it feels to me that, that the pandemic is the right way to end this. And I have decided to add on as the last part of this, what I'm calling the, the COVID coda. And in that, um, you see the way a state of sort of global emergency provides even more fuel to these processes of you know, the datafication of health, um, issues of you know making people more comfortable with sharing their data, overcoming boundaries of privacy because we are doing this for the great greater good. So any you know and all of these sort of COVID turning us all into trackers. So I had originally always made that argument in my introduction that in some way or another, if you think about it, all of us self track most people self-track, whether it's banking or clicking likes or noticing things, like there's so many ways, um, but not everybody was convinced. And I think after, after COVID, um, I think it's harder <laughs> just to push back on the idea that we're all self-trackers. Mm -hmm. we're, we're at home, we have anxiety, we might be under situations of quarantine, we are posting to Facebook our little test strips, we are downloading contact tracing apps to our phones. We are also um, download. There, there was just a, a efflorescence of stress management, anxiety management, sort of tracking tools, meditation tools, again, on Facebook and all of these other venues during the pandemic for kids and adults, right? Um, to help us manage our anxiety about 
our data, which is about sort of life and death, right? So, so it's really been this, this state of emergency, this moment that has brought all of this stuff to the fore in new ways and has even sort of turned the direction in which quantified self has taken itself. Um, the Aura Ring is now FDA approved and used you know, it shows up in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, because wow. it can predict COVID, the Fitbit as well. The, there's so many of these devices that, that use, sometimes users realized um, could show before you have symptoms that you um, have, have COVID. So suddenly there's just all of this, this attention um, that's directed. And I don't, that's really not a full answer, but that's what I'm thinking about in, my, um, in the conclusion to, to my book. So oh, I, I, I want to tell you that Lin, um, Louise Wiesing said, wrote saying that your uh, book has now been translated into Chinese and uh, China's readers are loving it, the, the addiction by design. Which yes, I, my, a student of mine sent it to me. It has a um, quite an intense cover. I, I didn't know anything about it till it arrived in the mail, but I've heard nothing. I've heard no reports on, you know, from readers. And I am so excited that it's there. So that's great to hear. Thank you. I'm not surprised because it is truly an amazing book. And I highly recommend that everyone read it. I give it to a variety of students of different backgrounds and invariably they love it. So I will finish saying thank you, Natasha. Um, good luck for the second talk of the day. <laughs> uh, this was amazing. Um, you gave us great perspective on, you know, this, this trend that seems to be kind of unstoppable and that we have to better understand, not so much to find if it's good or bad, but to actually understand how it works and, and how it is changing us, how it's changing it. Um, and also to try to get a sense of, you know, what, what kind of selves are being designed here, right? Um, which I think you know you did you did extremely well. So I want to thank you on behalf of all the organizers for being here today. I want to thank everyone who was here also, uh, and hopefully we'll see you all on May tenth. But thank you, Natasha. This was great. Thank you all so much.